So I will start recording. Okay. Thank you, everybody, to have come to our last um, seminar uh, of the Department of Religious Sciences of this semester and this academic year, actually. And uh, we're very honored to welcome um, Professor Itaya Levy from uh, Department of Earth Planetary Sciences at Weizmann Institute of Science. Um, Itai um, earned his um, B bachelor degree, cum laude in geology and in computer sciences from Ben Gurion University in the Negev in 2004, where he received also the Dean Awards for Academic Excellence. He also earned his master's degree in 2007 and PhD in 2010 in geochemistry from Harvard University in the United States. Over there, he was the recipient of a Fulbright uh, Graduate Fellowship, a Harvard University Origins of Life Initiative Fellowship, a Harvard University Merit Term Time Research Fellowship, and a NASA Earth and Space Science Fellowship, among other awards for excellence. For his postdoctoral postdoc work, he did it in California Institute of Technology, and Itai was awarded the Texaco Prize for Postdoctoral Fellowship, as well as the Sussman Center for Environmental Sciences Fellowship from the Weizmann Institute of Sciences. Wow, that's a lot of uh, um, fellowships. Itai joined the Department of Earth and Planetary Science at Weizmann Institute of Science in 2011, where he directs the Geochemical Laboratory for Experimental and Numerical Simulation. He was awarded also the Sir Charles Clore Prize for Outstanding Appointment in the Experimental Sciences in 2011, and a Long Fellowship from the Israel Council for Higher Education in 2012, and uh, Anna and Maurice Buchstein Career Development Chair from the Weizmann Institute of Sciences between 2015 and 2018 the Career Prize for Excellence in Scientific Research from the World Foundation in 2016, and the Scientific Council Prize for Chemistry at the Weizmann Institute of Sciences in 2018. Professor Itaya Levy strives to understand the tightly coupled evolution for, of the chemical composition of the oceans and atmosphere, the microbiological activity at Earth's surface, and the planet climate. So uh, we are very honored of his um, um, talk today. And he's going to talk about bioisotopic models, applications to micro, microbial physiology, natural environments, and Earth's history. So Itai, the podium is yours. Thank you, Nicholas, for this uh, nice introduction and for the invitation to speak in your uh, weekly seminar. Um, so yes, as you mentioned, in the past years, uh, my group has been uh, steadily marching down uh, more and more microbial paths, uh, so to speak. And today I'll tell you about a suite of uh, bioge biogeochemical uh, isotopic models which we've been developing. And these models can be used to provide uh, unique uh, constraints on uh, geologic, environmental, and uh, microbiological problems. And we apply them to uh, all sorts of problems. And I'll, I'll give uh, examples of, of some of these uh, applications. Um, so before moving on, I'd just like to mention that this whole adventure started uh, during a close collaboration with uh, Boz Wing uh, from uh, Colorado University in Boulder. And that most of the things that I'll present today come from the hard work of two uh, group members. One of them uh, is Christine Wenk, uh, former postdoctoral fellow in, in the group. Um, there we go. And uh, she worked on the energy metabolism of sulfate reducers. And the second is Jonathan Grop. He's a, an excellent PhD student who developed a bioisotopic model for methanogenesis and for anaerobic oxidation of methane, and, and uh, did this uh, and some um, thermodynamic calculations in collaboration with Mark Iron from uh, the computational chemistry unit at the Weizmann Institute, and with uh, Chu Sheng Jin from the University of Oregon uh, in, uh, in Eugene. Eugene. Okay, so. Here are some uh, interesting questions. Uh, they have to do with some of the most fund fundamental aspects of our planet, um, basically the close interaction between life and the environment, uh, both today and over the past 4 billion years or so of Earth history. Uh, and you may have noticed that most of these questions have close-ended, uh, sometimes numerical answers. When, um, how much, and so on. 
but really, once we have constraints on, on these aspects of Earth history and, and um, you know, biology as, as, as part of the Earth system, it's often the reasons or the controls uh, that are most interesting um, or the implications for Earth's, uh, Earth systems in, in general. Um, and it would be great if we could go back in time and make direct observations to answer these questions, but of course we can't. And instead we rely on proxy records. So proxies are physical or chemical properties that are preserved in the geologic record. And uh, they relate to, quanti to the quantities of interest um, in some understandable way. And uh, this is an example. I don't want you to, to look at the details of this at all. Um, just, uh, I'm just giving it as an example. This is a record over time from 4 billion years ago to the present day. Um, of carbon isotope ratios in carbonate minerals, uh, that's uh, these up here in black, and organic matter in sedimentary rocks. And again, I don't want you to spend any time um, on the details of this record or to try reading the labels or anything like that. I'm just using it as an illustration. Uh, and we, uh, excuse me, we use things like the, like the mean value um, at a given time interval or the offset between means uh, of two different materials or two different archives. Uh, or transient uh, excursions uh, from those mean values to learn something about uh, the environment and about uh, biogeochemical cycles and so on. In my training as, as, the, as a geologist and a geochemist, um, in a sense, is to try and avoid thinking about the biology behind these records and still learn something interesting about the Earth system, to try and simplify the processes so that I can still learn something without fully accounting for the, for the biology, or in this case, the microbiology. And in many cases, that's certainly possible. Um, but often, the answer that you get when you consider the actual processes behind the signals, uh, whether they are biological or non-biological, is quite different from the one you get when you bypass process. And in, in many cases, it's much richer than, uh, than what you get when you bypass the process. All right, the first, because many of the proxies that are used to reconstruct um, past environments and events uh, our isotopic, let's start with a reminder about stable isotopes. Um, and this is uh, isotopes that do not decay on observable timescales. Okay, so isotopes are, um, at, at the risk of repeating stuff that people already know, isotopes are, are atoms of an element that differ from each other in the number of uh, neutrons in their nucleus, and therefore their mass. Um, larger uh, atomic mass usually leads to stronger bonds, and this gives rise to two types of effects, which uh, lead to differences in isotopic composition between materials. Um, so an equilibrium isotope effect that's illustrated up here, um, th this arises when there is an isotopic exchange between two phases in equilibrium with each other. Uh, for example, uh, uh, here ions in a solution and um, in, in, a, in a mineral, organized in a mineral. The heavy isotopes preferentially partition into the, into the phase with the stiffer bonds. Um, and um, this basically decreases the, uh, uh, the energy of the system uh, by a gain in enthalpy and a loss in entropy and uh, minimizes, uh, minimizes the Gibbs free energy of, of the system. Now the difference between the isotopic composition of the materials is then in this case, the equilibrium fractionation. A kinetic isotope effect uh, occurs when uh, there are isotope specific rates of unidirectional reactions um, that differ for the different, uh, for the light and heavy isotopes. And this can occur, for example, due to stronger bonds of the heavy isotopes, and this would lead to preferential reaction of the uh, uh, light um, isotopes relative to, uh, to, the, to the molecules. Um, and, and so we would end up with an isotopic composition of the products that are, uh, that, that's um, enriched in the light isotopes relative to uh, the reactant from which it formed. Um, the difference in, in um, isotopic fractionation between the reactant and the instantaneous product is in this case, the kinetic fractionation. Um, and of course, if a reaction is not fully uh, unidirectional uh, or completely reversible, that is in equilibrium, then the net fractionation can vary uh, between uh, the equilibrium and kinetic end members. Okay, we report uh, isotopic composition as a ratio of the rare to abundant isotope in delta notation. So the ratio in a sample divided by that in a reference, uh, minus one and reported in, in parts per thousand or, or per mil. The same is true for, uh, I am showing this here for sulfur isotopes. Same is true for carbon and hydrogen isotopes. Um, the isotopic fractionation factor, uh, which I will refer to during the talk uh, from time to time, uh, 
um, is the, basically the ratio of the isotopic ratios in material A and B. That's the fractionation factor between A and B. And the fractionation is just the fractionation factor in per mil units. And it's approximately uh, equal to the difference in the isotopic composition of, uh, of the two materials. All right, so are there uh, any questions before, uh, before moving on? Okay. So we can use the geologic or environmental records of, of stable isotope compositions to address uh, the, you know, questions of the sort that I showed um, before. Uh, but to extract this information, um, we need mechanistic understanding of the underlying processes. And biological fractionations often lie at the base of many of the lag stable isotope records that we'd like to interpret. Now in my group, we also work to understand the subsequent processes that affect the isotopic composition of natural materials after their deposition, including the processes that, that lead to their uh, preservation in sedimentary rocks, uh, their burial and exhumation, um, and, and, uh, and exposure, which is when we um, sample and study them. Um, and again, this is also that we can use, this is all um, for the purpose of using the environmental and geologic record of the chemical and isotopic composition of natural materials to learn about modern and ancient environments and the suite of processes that control their physical and chemical properties. Uh, but today I'll focus on the, on the base of this pyramid, which are uh, the biological fractionations. And what we'd like to do is to understand how organisms fractionate isotopes, because this basically uh, generates the signals that we often observe in the rock record and natural environments. Okay, so organisms, uh, even the simplest ones are, are uh, very complex, and it's not realistic to fully resolve all of the reactions taking place within them. Fortunately, um, this is usually not necessary, and the reactions that leave the most pronounced isotopic imprint on the substrates and on the products uh, can be organized in relatively simple reaction networks. Now here's an illustration that I picked randomly from this chart. It's not of any importance to the talk. Um, and we, we can often capture the isotopic effect um, of, uh, of the organism's activity by developing models to account for only a subset of reactions. We don't need all the reactions in this chart. And we can use these models to ask questions about the metabolic pathways themselves. I like to call these inward facing investigations and I'll, I'll show some examples of this. Or we can use them in investigations um, of uh, current and paleo environments. Um, and I like to call these outward facing investigations and I'll, I'll give examples of these as well. All right, so jumping right in. Uh, I think this is the only slide that has any math in it. I apologize. Um, Right, so, so from, from stable isotope theory, we can show that the net fractionation uh, of a reaction, whether it's chemical or biological, uh, is a function of the fractionation factor at uh, thermodynamic equilibrium, which is this alpha equilibrium. Um, and this is again related to the partition functions of the various isotopically substituted reactants and, and, and products. Um, a kinetic fractionation, which reflects isotope specific reaction rates, as I mentioned before. Um, and these equilibrium and kinetic fractionation end members are related through this F value, which is uh, a reversibility of the reaction. And this is just a measure of the reaction's departure from equilibrium, how close or how far it is from equilibrium. An F value of one means we're at equilibrium. And so um, you can do the math, alpha net, you know, the, the, the kinetic fractionation drops out and we're left with the equilibrium fractionation. As F approaches uh, zero, uh, the equilibrium fractionation goes away and we're left with the kinetic fractionation. Um, and the key to transitioning between these end members, the equilibrium and kinetic end members, is to relate the reversibility, this F value, to the chemical and physical state of the system and to the physiology of the, of the microbes. And it turns out that we can do this using what's called the flux force relationship. This is a, a, basically a theory for enzymatically catalyzed reactions. And again, I don't, I don't want you to uh, dive into this equation at all, only to show that the net rate of a, a biochemical reaction, this J here, which is the forward minus the reverse rate, um, can be deconvolved into a term that uh, embodies the catalytic properties of the enzyme itself, and a term that represents the thermodynamic drive for the reaction. And when we divide both sides of this equation by the forward rate, 
and solve for the ratio of the reverse to the forward rate, which is by definition this reversibility that I've been uh, discussing, um, the kinetic terms basically cancel out and we're left with an expression that uh, depends only on the um, free energy of the reaction and on temperature, which you can see down here. And this is exactly the reversibility that we need in order to calculate the net fractionation of this single reaction. Now this is for a single enzymatically catalyzed reaction, but we can extend this network to include an arbitrary number of steps. Uh, and this just ends up being a recursive expression for the net fractionation of, of the entire reaction chain, which depends on the equilibrium and kinetic fractionation um, of the most upstream step, this uh, step up here, um, and the net fractionation that's inherited from downstream steps. Okay, so this, this is a, like a nested uh, expression. Um, and to apply this approach, we need um, isotopic data sets from lab cultures against which we can test um, our models. And uh, microbial sulfate reduction turns out to be a great case because uh, these data sets do in fact exist. Um, so microbial sulfate reduction um, th that's shown in this uh, schematic uh, reaction, this is of course not, um, this is not uh, uh, the actual pathway or the actual reaction, it's schematic. Um, so this is an important um, anaerobic metabolism and it's responsible for about half of the organic matter degradation in marine sediments. Uh, the sulfide that is uh, produced by this metabolism can precipitate as the iron sulfide mineral pyrite, um, in um, um, or it can be oxidized back to sulfate depending on, on, um, on the oxidation state of the sediments. If it does uh, precipitate as pyrite, it leaves a record of, micro of microbial sulfate reduction um, in, uh, in sedimentary rocks. And burial of this pyrite is a major uh, indirect source of oxygen, uh, and so MSR uh, is, is uh, thought to serve as a coupling between the cycles of sulfur, carbon, and oxygen. Um, and of course, we would like to, to understand uh, its role in, in these coupled cycles. The sulfur isotope fractionation between uh, sulfate and sulfide um, during microbial sulfate reduction has been studied in the lab since uh, the mid-50s. And one of the things that emerges is a clear relationship between the cell-specific sulfate reduction rate that's shown here on the x-axis in uh, femtomoles per cell per day and the microbial fractionation or epsilon 34 on, on the, um, the y-axis. And uh, what you can see is that with increasing cell-specific sulfate reduction rate, the fractionation decreases. And this is observed in a variety of studies um, you know, over the years. Um, the data here are specifically from, from three um, studies. Um, okay, so this uh, empirical relationship, right, for which we have no clear mechanistic understanding, um, has been a cornerstone of uh, interpretations of the geologic uh, sulfur isotope record. Um, and I'll talk about this in a bit. And a second relationship that emerges, um, and it's uh, less frequently studies and shows more, more scatter or more variation, um, is the dependence of the microbial fractionation on the ambient concentration of, uh, of sulfate. Uh, and this is typically explained uh, by reservoir effects that are associated with the um, utilization of sulfate that is taken up by the cells. Okay, so in the first uh, so application of this framework that I've discussed, uh, the bioisotopic models, um, together with uh, a close uh, colleague, Boz Wing from uh, CU Boulder, um, we, we basically set out to under, try and understand these patterns. Um, now, given what was known about the, uh, the details or the, the, the insides of this metabolism, we cast the individual steps as a linear um, network of enzymatically catalyzed reactions, and we treated them uh, by the combined thermodynamic kinetic approach that I showed, the flux force relationship. Um, and when we do this, we can, we can fit the existing experimental data sets uh, very nicely, both in terms of the dependence of, of uh, epsilon, the fractionation on the cell-specific reduction rate, and its dependence on the sulfate concentrations. Uh, now, th you know, this is, um, uh, I mean, th these are two examples. These are for uh, archaea, uh, the ones up here on the left are for thermophilic archaea uh, as a function of sul sulfate concentrations. And here, uh, these are for uh, mesophilic uh, bacteria as a function of the cell-specific reduction rate. Um, and so this is the first 
mechanistic explanation. There have been models that have fit these data in the past, um, but not um, relating mechanistically the, uh, the reversibility required to reproduce these data to um, the conditions at which the cell were, uh, were living and metabolizing. And what's nice um, in addition to this is that we can now make predictions for what these relationships would look in, in cases where the isotopic measurements were, were not made. Um, so for example, for, for, uh, for these experiments up here with the archaea, um, the fractionation as a function of the cell-specific self introduction rate was not measured. We can make predictions of, uh, or was measured in only a handful of samples, and we can make predictions of what this relationship would look like if it were measured in, in, in all the samples. Um, these uh, um, experiments down here were conducted for a single concentration of sulfate. We can um, predict what the fractionations would be at different cell-specific sulfate reduction rates. That's what's on, shown on these contours. Um, uh, what the cell specific, uh, what the fractionation would be uh, at different sulfate concentrations. And what this means is that the model is, is testable. We or others can perform similar experiments at variable sulfate concentrations and, and respiration rates. And we can see whether this approach um, finally lets us relate microbial physiology and environment to isotopic fractionation or whether we need for, uh, further uh, refinements. And so the, the, the takeaway message here is that this approach very nicely reproduces not only the range in um, the fractionation in, uh, in epsilon, uh, but also its dependence on both uh, sulfate respiration rate and the extracellular concentration of sulfate. And uh, as you know, this has been observed in so many um, experimental studies. All right, so what can we uh, learn with this new approach? So the first thing that, that, um, you know, that I'd like to apply this to is um, is about the metabolic pathway itself. Uh, because we can calculate the reversibility of the steps in the sulfate reduction uh, me metabolism, we can for the first time understand the origin of this concavity, of this relationship between the cell-specific rate and, and epsilon. Um, and um, what we see here is the reversibility as the, uh, these heat map, these are heat maps of the reversibility of the four reactions in the pathway, sulfate uptake, its activation to form APS, that's this reaction here, then the reduction of that APS to form sulf uh, sulfite, and the uh, uh, two-step reduction of the um, sulfite to give us uh, H2S, which then diffuses out of the cell. And we can see which of, which of these reactions is responsible for this shape, which one departs from, uh, uh, from reversibility or from equilibrium first. Uh, we can see that, it, uh, that it's the APS reduction. And so at, at these relatively low rates of cell-specific sulfate reduction rate, the departure from equilibrium of APS reduction is what's responsible for this sharp drop in the fractionation. And then this long drawn out uh, decrease to the uh, overall kinetic fractionation of the pathway uh, is because of the departure from equilibrium of the of sulfate uptake uh, into the cell. You can see that sulfate activation to APS and sulfite reduction um, uh, remain uh, close to equilibrium throughout. Um, and so now we have this uh, um, an understanding of the reasons for the departure from equilibrium of uh, the uh, uh, fractionation associated with microbial sulfate reduction. What we can also do is constrain the, con uh, the, the conservation of energy in sulfate reduction, or, or more specifically, the identity of uh, the electron carrier reduced and oxidized pairs that are used by the microbes in the reduction of APS to, uh, to sulfite, uh, this reaction here catalyzed by APR, and the reduction of sulfite to sulfide catalyzed by the uh, DSR uh, complex. Um, so several candidates have been suggested um, for the electron carrier uh, reduced and oxidized pairs, and this is based on genomic studies and, and, me and measurements of intracellular metabolites. Um, and there have also been various uh, electron bifurcation or confurcation uh, schemes um, uh, suggested where uh, uh, these are basically schemes where unfavorable reactions are, are driven forward by coupling to a favorable reaction. Um, and so there have been uh, various suggestions, uh, but uh, this, hasn't been, this hadn't been resolved before. And what, what Christine did, um, was to apply this uh, bioisotopic model of sulfate reducers to try and answer this question. Now, um, because these uh, electron carriers have very different redox potentials, uh, in some cases, 
the high, elect uh, the high uh, redox potential electron carriers like ferrodoxin and flavodoxin and cytochrome C3 were proposed to um, be involved in these reactions because the delta G of these reactions at standard state is, is, um, is positive or only weakly negative. Uh, and so it was hypothesized that you need these um, strong potential electron carriers in order to drive the reaction forward. Um, um, but the important thing to, to remember that the cell is not at, uh, at the standard state. Um, the, the concentrations of the intracellular metabolites are, are free to adjust, and this is what happens uh, when, when we solve these models uh, for the uh, steady state at a given um, cell-specific self-introduction rate. Um, and if the net metabolic reaction, which is controlled by the extracellular concentrations of the uh, reactants and products, if that's um, favorable enough, then this adjustment of the intracellular metabolite concentrations results in an actual not a standard state delta G, but the actual delta G of the individual reactions in the pathway that um, uh, are negative and allow net forward uh, reaction. Uh, and so when you, um, um, when you account, so this is, this is an, an example for, for why, uh, you know, um, ferrodoxin and, and flavodoxin were, were, um, proposed to be the electron carriers involved in APS reduction, right? Because otherwise, the delta G of APS reduction is a small positive number, and people thought that it wouldn't, it wouldn't go forward. But what was not taken into account is the ability of the intracellular metabolites to, um, to adjust, the concentrations to adjust. OK. Um, and so what we did was basically use uh, isotopic, fraction, uh, isotopic data to, to um, constrain this problem. And what do I mean? So at the slowest rates in the lab, and definitely in, uh, almost all rates in nature, the fractionation of sulfur isotopes during sulfur reduction is large. It is uh, close to the thermodynamic fractionation. And what this means is that not only the entire pathway is close to equilibrium, it's operating at extremely low energy, but what that means is that each of the individual reactions within the cell is also close to equilibrium. Um, and so what we did was, um, to try and evaluate which of these electron carrier pairs actually allows near equilibrium conditions within the cell, which is to say actually allows um, us to, to reproduce large isotopic fractionations uh, under the conditions in which these microbes were grown. Um, and so this is a figure of the um, delta G uh, of, of APS reduction. So this reaction that's circled in green versus the delta G of uh, sulfite reduction in, uh, in red uh, for these various proposed um, electron carrier pairs, including some electron um, confrication and bifurcation schemes. And what you see in the contours are, is the magnitude of the microbial fractionation, going all the way from around 20 per mil up to the uh, to near equilibrium values, which is where um, which is what we should be able to reproduce. Um, so anywhere in this figure where we don't hit these red uh, colors um, is an impossible um, identity for the, uh, for the electron carriers. So you can see ferrodoxin here, uh, and I, a confrication scheme with menaquinone and ferrodoxin, cytochrome C3, flavodoxin, all of these um, cannot give us large enough fractionations when the cell is operating at low cell-specific reduction uh, rates. The ones that can, the ones that are left, are rubridoxin, rubriferine, and uh, menaquinone. And um, uh, indeed, uh, in, in subsequent studies, menaquinone, and, and before menaquinone has been suggested in the past as well, um, but um, uh, our work basically shows that, that, uh, that it has to be a, a small, a redox potential electron carrier um, so that it can allow near equilibrium fractionation. Otherwise, we would not observe these relationships that we observe in nature. Um, and so why would evolution do this, right? Why not select the electron carrier pairs that result in the most favorable forward reaction, right? Why not work with these high redox potential electron carriers that actually allow you to you know, drive the reaction forward quickly? Um, 
And so we think that the answer lies in the fact that sulfate reducers generally live in uh, severely energy limited environments. So these are environments where the net delta G for reaction is very low of order, um, you know, minus 10, minus 20 kilojoules per mole. So there's very little energy to be gained from reducing sulfate to sulfide using uh, these uh, simple organic molecules. Um, and in this case, the organism can't afford to have highly favorable reactions um, because then it needs to spend a lot of energy reducing the electron carriers back to their reduced state so that it can keep operating. Uh, and so these modest electron, uh, uh, the, sorry, these modest um, redox potential electron carriers and the adju this adjustment that I talked about of the intracellular metabolite concentrations, um, they allow the organism to result in uh, intracellular reactions that are just favorable enough to, uh, to move forward. And this is the, the uh, least wasteful way uh, to make a living. And you can see that here in this, um, in this figure of the sulfate reduction rate on the, on the y-axis as a function of the Gibbs free energy that's available, available for, the, for the catabolic reaction. And so you can see that with these small um, potential electron carriers, right, the ones, the ones that are at the bottom of this um, redox tower, uh, any given rate is achieved, so any, any given rate on the y-axis is achieved at a lower uh, value of the uh, Gibbs free energy. Um, so, you know, with ferredoxin, it's hard to see. The slope is, uh, the slope is, um, is, uh, is larger than with menaquinone and rubridoxin. What that means is that this red curve will cross these blue curves somewhere at some value of delta G, and in that case, it is more, uh, it makes more sense of, from an evolutionary standpoint to select fer uh, uh, ferredoxin, right? So if you're living in, in, in extremely high energy environments, making your reactions go forward as fast as possible gives you an edge. But when you're living in, in very low energy environments, not wasting any energy to recycle your electron carriers uh, makes the most sense. And another way to think about this is, is um, a minimization of, of energy dissipation. So it's not enough to drive a metabolic reaction like sulfate reduction. It's not enough to drive it forward only once. Uh, like I said, the electron carriers need to be uh, recycled so that the forward reaction can continue. And that's like using the, the energy from the ball that's up here, um, rolling downhill, using that to drive your reaction forward and then pushing it all the way back up um, the hill so that we can keep doing this again and again. And so um, what you have in the case of these high potential electron carriers are, uh, is, 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 is a big hill. What you have with these uh, low potential um, uh, electron carriers is a smaller hill, which is just enough. You know, the energy of this ball rolling down uh, downhill here is just enough to push your reactions forward and you don't spend as much energy bringing it back up to where it needs to be. Um, okay. And so, um, I mean, you can see from these uh, two reactions um, that the transformed delta G uh, uh, it's at a standard state is positive, um, and so uh, it makes uh, it makes sense to uh, use a, a modest uh, redox potential electron carrier in this case, menaquinone, which has a redox potential of uh, minus seventy four millivolts, um, but there are other organisms that live in even lower energy environments. And these are some that I'll, I'll talk about next. And these are methanogens. Um, and so th these are organisms that uh, produce, uh, that degrade organic matter or react carbon dioxide with hydrogen through various pathways to make uh, methane. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, they, they live under conditions of, of even lower energy. And you can see that here, this is the organic carbon oxidation rate with depth in a, into a sediment or, or with age, the sediment age, you can see that on the, on the y-axis. Um, and what you can see is that um, the rate of organic carbon uh, oxidation is closely matched by the rate of sulfate reduction. And this is basically until uh, these horizontal lines, this is where sulfate runs out. Um, so, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about uh, the redox zonation of sediments in a little bit. Um, basically, this is where sulfate runs out and methanogenesis picks up. So um, methanogenesis rates are, are low, where sulfate is still abundant, and as soon as sulfate um, runs out, this trajectory of decreasing rates of organic carbon oxidation are then taken up by methanogenesis. Um, 
So methanogens live at even lower energy conditions down here than do the sulfate producers. And when you look at their, um, at their redox reactions, basically the reduction of carbon dioxide in four steps to, um, to methane, and you look at the um, uh, electron carriers that are utilized, these are, actually, these are actually quite energetic. So we have ferredoxin here, um, which has a redox potential of minus uh, almost 400 millivolts. Uh, we have F420 with minus 360, and uh, we have um, uh, coenzyme uh, B with uh, minus 43, 143 millivolts. Um, and so we can ask, do methanogens invalidate this idea of you know, carefully tailored redox reactions as an adaptation to a, uh, to a low energy environment? Um, and we don't, um, we don't think so. And uh, this is based on the work um, um, of uh, Jonathan Grope, uh, who I mentioned uh, is a very talented PhD student in my group. And he's uh, developed a suite of, of these bioisotopic models for microbial methane production and consumption. And I'll, I'll uh, go over them in a little bit. So when we take um, a full bioisotopic of hydrogenotrophic methanogenesis, uh, which is the production of methane by reduction of CO2 with hydrogen, um, and the intracellular uh, metabolites do indeed adjust uh, to allow net forward uh, reaction. And you can see that uh, here in this um, plot of the cumulative delta G of the uh, carbon reactions for a given environmental delta G. Okay, so we, um, it's hard to see for this minus 12 kilojoules per mole value, which is the lowest value at which we were able to make the, um, the metabolism run forward. Uh, but you can see that here when we plot this on a log scale. And this is the cumulative delta G. And the fact that it, you know, that, that it is mon monotonically decreasing means that um, there's net forward reaction here. The metabolites um, adjust in concentration uh, to allow net forward uh, to allow net forward reaction. Um, but again, this is the outcome of um, the specific concentrations of the electron carriers that are involved. Now, some of these electron carriers are very energetic, but a choice of a less energetic electron carrier in this case would not allow net forward reaction. Um, because, for example, we have reactions with a positive delta G for this, uh, for this reaction to go forward, we need either exceptionally high concentrations of the reactants or exceptionally low concentrations of, of the products. If we have exceptionally low concentrations of, of the products here, cascade that all the way to down here, we have exceptionally low concentrations of these reactants. We need something energetic in order to make this reaction move forward. Um, and so we think that this, that, that carefully tailored redox reactions are um, an evolutionary adaptation to living in low energy environments um, so that you can keep uh, even at very low, uh, a very small negative delta G of the net reaction, net metabolic reaction, you can uh, keep your metabolism uh, moving forward uh, by wasting as little energy as possible, but pushing reactions uh, hard enough um, to overcome, um, so, you know, so that intracellular adjustments of, of, of metabolites are enough to keep you uh, moving forward. Um, and this raises a, a more general question of whether we, we expect this uh, strategy to be a general phenomenon. We see it for sulfate reducers and we think we see it for, uh, for methanogens as well. Um, is, it, is it a more uh, general phenomenon? And, and I think that the answer here is that not necessarily. Um, and what, you, what we can see here is on the x-axis, the uh, what's called the nominal, nom, nominal oxidation state of carbon. So the, the, high, uh, the more positive the number, the more oxidized the carbon, the more uh, bound it is to oxygens, for example. Um, the more negative, the more reduced, or uh, more bound to, to hydrogens. Um, and so um, in this study by uh, Kelly et al., what they did was basically to, to um, classify organic molecules uh, by, uh, by their nominal oxidation state of carbon. And what they noted was that under um, increasingly or under anaerobic conditions, there is increasing preservation of the um, um, 
molecules with a lower or the compounds with a lower NOSC. And um, so, you know, for, for, for example, uh, in, in, in uh, oxic environments, basically all of these things are, are uh, reacted um, or, you know, degraded uh, on a certain time scale. In anaerobic um, uh, environments, um, these more oxidized uh, molecules do get degraded, but the more reduced ones uh, stick around uh, for longer. And uh, the, the reason is that uh, the, basically the thermodynamic drive of, of oxidizing these various organic molecules um, with the different, um, uh, uh, with the different uh, electron acceptors or, or oxidants. So what, uh, the thermodynamic drive is, is, is an indication of, of how favorable, uh, how thermodynamically favorable a reaction is. So when it's one, the reaction is not limited by thermodynamics at all. Where it's zero, um, the reaction uh, will, uh, will not happen. Um, um, and when it's, it's less than zero, it means it wants to happen in the, in the, reverse, in the reverse direction. And so what you can see here is that you know, the, the uh, redox donation that we're used to thinking about in, uh, in sediments, for example, um, is reflected in, in this uh, thermodynamic favorability of the, uh, of, or in the thermodynamic driving force for these reactions. And you can see that, that irrespective of the value of, of NOSC, if you're oxidizing with O2, you can get rid of pretty much, the, the, there's a thermodynamic, you're only limited by kinetics. You're not limited by thermodynamics. Uh, that's also close to being true for almost any oxidation state with nitrate and with manganese. But once you, you go to these less energetic um, uh, metabolisms, once you, you try to um, oxidize the, these organic molecules with um, ferric iron oxides or with sulfate, um, there are certain oxidation states for which the thermodynamic drive is zero or, or less than zero. Um, and what that, what that means is that, that these are the, the, the low NOSC uh, molecules are ones that cannot be, um, cannot be degraded by, um, by these uh, less energetic, um, less energetic uh, electron acceptors. Um, and so, it doesn't make sense if you're if you're an organism that's not thermodynamically limited. It doesn't make sense to you don't need to carefully tailor your um, your redox reactions in terms of the electron carriers. What you need is to optimize your uh, enzyme kinetics because you're limited by kinetics as opposed to being limited by thermodynamics. If you're if you're um, uh, an organism living at at, at low energy. Uh, and so we're in the process of, of, of testing this uh, with um, um, bioinformatic uh, uh, data from, uh, from enzyme databases. Um, so, you know, um, uh, I, I hope to be able to, to update you on, on the outcome of these uh, in, sometime in the future. Um, so we think that this, this careful tailoring of redox reactions is something that is specific to um, low energy environments or organisms living in low energy environments. Okay, so um, I'd like to uh, move on, but stay with, with uh, Jonathan's work for a little longer. Um, and so let's see what we've learned by uh, applying this approach to uh, methanogenesis, that's the production of methane, and methanotrophy. So first a little bit about methane. Uh, it's mostly produced by uh, the activity of, of methanogenic archaea. Um, in natural and, and, and in artificial environments, uh, but also by uh, industrial, industrial processes. Um, there's uh, some thermogenic production of, uh, of uh, methane, uh, but it's more minor. Um, and presently, uh, these large anthropogenic sources of, of methane are driving an increase in methane concentration in the atmosphere. And because methane is a, is a greenhouse gas with ab absorption bands that uh, are outside the, the saturated bands of carbon dioxide and water vapor, about 25% of global warming is uh, related to, to this increase in the methane concentrations that you can see here from um, the late 80s to the present day. And um, we try to understand the budgets, the methane budgets, using the, the isotopic composition of, of, of methane. So the, the isotopic composition of methane varies um, depending on its source and on the reactions that it undergoes after its production. And uh, we tried to, uh, or the, the community has tried to use these variations to identify the source of the methane uh, 
um, and this has been um, this has been a, a, an ongoing practice for 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 a long time. So here here you, you can see, for example, uh, delta C thirteen and delta D, uh, so the carbon and hydrogen isotopic compositions of methane uh, that are used to do, to identify the source of methane. But what you can also see is that there is significant overlap in these fields, and this leads to non-unique um, identification of of, uh, of the methane source and the processes that it undergoes. Um, and to, in part, to, to better identify the sources of methane, um, analysis of, of methane clumped isotopes um, has been developed in, in John Eiler's lab at Caltech. Um, and these are basically methane molecules with uh, more than one rare isotope. For example, here, both a C13 and, uh, and a deuterium. Um, or uh, it, can, it can be a C12 and two deuteriums. Um, and in, in isotopic equilibrium, the abundance of these multiply substituted isotopologs of methane, which is uh, denoted here in capital uh, delta uh, 18, um, at equilibrium, this shows a really nice dependence on the temperature. And so the hope is that uh, these clumped isotopes can be um, uh, used to identify the, uh, the temperature formation of, of, of this methane. Um, but what was also shown in this work and in, and in a handful of other studies is that there is a clear disequilibrium in many um, natural samples, and which is to say that the samples don't sit on this um, temperature, the predicted temperature dependent equilibrium uh, clumped isotope composition. So all these values below the line are in disequilibrium. Uh, so what we wanted to do was to understand the isotopic composition of methane in the environment and in lab cultures. Um, with an emphasis on these departures from equilibrium of both traditional and clumped uh, methane isotopes. Um, and we wanted to understand the reason for, for their existence. And in order to do this, Jonathan developed a bioisotopic model of methanogenesis that I mentioned before. Uh, I'll talk a little more about that now. Um, I won't talk about clumped isotopes today, only uh, uh, briefly the model and some carbon and hydrogen um, isotope results, but not clumped. So there are three main types of methanogenesis. There's hydrogenotrophic methanogenesis, in there where carbon dioxide is reduced uh, in seven steps, and the electrons come from, from hydrogen. You can see that in the blue reaction here. There is acetoclastic uh, methanogenesis, in, uh, in which acetate is disproportionated, uh, basically, to, to form uh, methane and CO2 in, in equal proportions. And there's methylotrophic um, methanogenesis, and, and this is where methanol is either disproportionated to form methane and CO2 at a three to one ratio, or it's reduced with hydrogen to, to give uh, methane. Um, so the hydrogenotrophic pathway is, is the most energetic. You can see that here from these delta G values. Um, uh, and yeah, this is both at the standard state and at millimolar concentrations in the rightmost uh, column. Um, and this is the pathway that, that uh, we started with, that we, that we modeled. And we replace this net reaction, of course, this is a net reaction, we replace it with uh, the, uh, the list of reactions that you saw in one of the previous slides, um, and uh, which represents this, um, this more uh, complicated view of the metabolic pathway, but uh, still simplified in, in, in certain ways. Uh, it's a more realistic representation of the hydrogen trophic methanogenesis path, uh, uh, pathway. And we cast these reactions as a set of um, um, coupled uh, differential equations. And this allows us to solve for the concentrations of, of all of these intracellular metabolites and for the steady state rates of methane production, rates of methanogenesis. And using um, the experimental ranges of enzyme kinetic parameters uh, were able to reproduce uh, the relationship between the cell specific methanogenesis rates, this SMR on the y axis, and the concentration of hydrogen, which is the main control on, on the delta G in these lab culture experiments. So we can fit the experiments quite nicely, and it's, it's um, a nice place to start. What we can also do, like uh, as for sulfate reduction, we can study the uh, departure from reversibility of the various steps in the pathway. And you can see that here, as we depart from equilibrium, from a, delta, uh, a minus delta G of reaction of, of, of zero towards uh, more negative delta G values, uh, the reactions progressively depart from equilibrium at, in, in a certain order, and, I'll, and I'll, get, I'll get into this in a moment. 
And when we account for this, um, we are able to reproduce, uh, just as in self introduction, we're able to reproduce um, decades of, of lab cultures, both at, um, uh, in thermophilic uh, cultures in red and mesophilic cultures in, in blue. Um, and what you can see here is that there's a relationship of the um, carbon isotope fractionation associated with methanogenesis with the delta G of reactions. Um, and what, um, what you don't uh, yet know, but I'll tell you, is that the equilibrium fractionation is here somewhere around 70 per mil. And so here we see something strange that is different from what we see in sulfur reduction. In sulfur reduction, we basically see as we depart from equilibrium, we go from large equilibrium fractionations of around 60 or 70 per mil all the way down to um, uh, kinetic fractionations of around 10 uh, per mil. Here we see first an increase the, to these larger than equilibrium fractionations, and it's followed only then by a decrease to, to these uh, lower than equilibrium fractionations. And uh, the reason for this basically, we can now say, is the departure from equilibrium of these last two steps in the, in the pathway. So you can see that MCR and MTR depart from equilibrium at the lowest values of del uh, delta G or the, the, the closest to zero values of, of delta G. And it turns out that the kinetic fractionations of these enzymes um, are larger than the equilibrium fractionations associated with the reactions that they catalyze. And so as they depart from equilibrium, we gradually replace the, uh, in, in the um, recursive uh, expression that I showed before, we gradually replace the equilibrium fractionation by the kinetic fractionation as F goes from one from equilibrium down to zero um, as it departs from equilibrium. And so because the kinetic fractionation is larger than equilibrium fractionation, we get this increase to larger than equilibrium values and only then a decrease to, to lower values. And we can do similar things with, um, with, uh, with hydrogen isotopes. Here I'm not showing the dependence on the reaction rate or the delta G, but the dependence on the um, isotopic composition of hydrogen in the system. So at high hydrogen concentrations, some of the um, hydrogen in methane actually comes from the dihydrogen and not from the water. At low hydrogen concentrations, it comes mostly from the water. We're able to reproduce that and the dependence on uh, the isotopic uh, composition of the um, uh, of the H2. Okay, so, so far, um, using both the models of sulfate reduction and methanogenesis, we looked in and tried to understand the aspects of the microbes physiology and, and energy conservation. Um, and what I'd like to do next is, is look out, um, see, uh, give, um, I hope I, I'll have time to give both examples, but if not, just one, examples where, uh, where, we, uh, where we look out. Um, so the first, first example comes from observations of variation in, in the carbon isotopic uh, composition of methane in marine sediments. So we've all seen some version of this, um, uh, this column, and this uh, schematically shows the redox donation in sediments. Um, so in the topmost sediments, uh, we have aerobic respiration, which is the dominant organic matter degradation pathway. And once we run out of oxygen, uh, we go through a progression of less and less energetic uh, electron acceptors. And I, I've talked about this uh, when I talked about the choice of electron carriers. Um, and until we, we end up with the last uh, two least uh, energetic um, uh, organic matter degradation reactions, which are uh, sulfate reduction and methanogenesis. And that's, uh, these are all that are left. Now, um, methanogenesis takes over from sulfate reduction in this classical view. At, uh, at what's called uh, sulfate methane uh, transition zones or, or SMTZs. Um, now, there's an interesting observation at these SMTZs. Uh, it's been observed for a while. This is a, uh, uh, an example from a relatively recent paper, but it's, this, this has been observed for longer, um, that carbon isotopes um, behave strangely at SMTZs. So what happens at the SMTZs is that the methane is being consumed by um, microbes that use sulfate as their terminal electron acceptor or as, uh, as the oxidant. Um, and lab cultures have shown also for, for, for a very long time that the residual methane, that is the methane that um, did, doesn't react with sulfate and is left behind, it becomes enriched in the heavy carbon isotopes. So it becomes enriched in, in C13. During this anaerobic oxidation of methane using sulfate or AOM, 
anaerobic oxidation of methane, there's a preference for utilization of, um, of uh, C13 depleted methane or, or C12 enriched methane. Um, but in SMTZs, something happens that is contrary to the expectations from the lab cultures. So methane becomes, um, excuse me, methane becomes isotopically depleted, becomes de depleted in carbon-13 and only then enriched. Um, and there are several suggested explanations, but no agreement in the literature about the cause of this phenomenon. And um, uh, basically, Yoshinaga and colleagues suggested that there is, uh, this is maybe related to the limitation of the uh, terminal electron acceptor, uh, the, basically the concentrations of, of sulfate. And um, so Gunther Wegener from, from the Max Planck Institute in Bremen, who was a co-author on the Yoshinaga paper, um, conducted a set of AOM experiments to uh, different sulfate levels to test uh, these ideas that they put uh, forward uh, in the Yoshinaga et al. paper. Um, and he had uh, high sulfate experiments which mimic the conditions at the top of the sulfate methane transition zones, and he had low sulfate um, uh, experiments that mimic the concentration, the uh, conditions at the bottom of the SMTZ. Um, and he did indeed found that um, methane carbon and hydrogen isotopes behave very differently at these different sulfate levels. Um, so focusing just on the carbon isotopes in the interest of time, at high sulfate, the residual methane becomes um, gradually enriched in C13, and this is as observed in previous culture experiments. But at low sulfate, uh, the methane becomes depleted in C13. And this is um, consistent with what's observed uh, in the lower halves of, of SMTZs. So, so it does appear that sulfate availability is an important control on the isotopic composition of methane in SMTZs, but the question is why? Um, and so to try to mechanistically understand their experimental data and answer this question, uh, Gunter and, and his colleagues uh, contacted us at a Goldschmidt conference a few years ago after hearing uh, Jonathan give a talk about his methanogenesis model. And we began uh, a collaboration in which uh, Jonathan developed a bioisotopic model of uh, AOM, um, which accounts for the various reactions in this multi-step uh, pathway. And I won't go into the details of the, of the model in the interest of time, but just show that the model, uh, which is shown by the red and black lines and envelopes, very nicely captures the isotopic evolution that's observed in the experiments, which are these uh, bl uh, black and red circles. Um, and the story is quite similar to those that I've uh, uh, told you about sulfate reduction and methanogenesis. Basically, the concentrations of the pathway substrates, methane and sulfate, and the products, which are D uh, DIC and sulfide, they determine the net delta G of the reaction. Um, and this, in turn, um, uh, controls the concentrations of intracellular metabolites, the uh, reversibility of, of the individual steps in, in the pathway, and then this reversibility pathway uh, landscape um, at um, the reversibility landscape at, at, at high sulfate concentrations and at low sulfate concentrations gives rise to these different net fractionations and the different isotopic uh, evolution. And so by, by applying the approach of combining culture experiments and a bioisotopic model of AOM, uh, we were able to, to explain this uh, strange uh, and persistent observation of methane, methane uh, C13 depletion in SMTZs. And um, maybe just very, very briefly, the last forward-facing uh, or outward-facing um, um, example is one in which we used our bioisotopic model of sulfate reduction to try and understand the global record of sulfur isotopes in uh, marine pyrite. Now, what you see here on the left is, is the uh, isotopic offset, sulfur isotopic offset between um, pyrite and, and co coeval um, sulfate. And you can see that it has increased uh, over Earth history from uh, about three and a half billion years ago to the present day. Um, it has increased uh, in, in, in several steps. You, you can see that here in these, uh, uh, for these geologic eons from the Archean to the Proterozoic to the Phanerozoic and, um, and, and to the modern. Um, and um, you can also see, what you can also see is that from relatively tight distributions in the in the Archean and Proterozoic, these distributions really opened up. So the vari variability has also become much larger over time. And we wanted to understand 
this, um, the reasons for this uh, behavior. Um, and what we did was to embed the sulfate reduction model that I showed uh, that we developed um, in a diagenetic model where we account for transport and reaction of the various um, uh, chemicals in, in, in the sediments, um, both dissolved and, um, and solid uh, species of sulfur and, and iron. Um, and when, when we do this, what we end up with is an estimate of the microbial fractionation, which ends up being large, if, uh, ir almost irrespective of where you are. And uh, with the, uh, at the rates of sulfate reduction that, that, are, uh, that occur in natural environments, the fractionation ends up being large. Now you can see here that the, that the, um, the color bar or the, the z-axis here essentially goes from 64 per mil almost to, uh, to, to like 80 per mil. And this is very close to the temperature dependent um, equilibrium. Uh, what we do see, though, is substantial variation in the um, sulfate pyrite offset. And that covers a range of uh, from around 30 per mil all the way up to, uh, to 70 per mil. Um, and so the, the reason for this, what happens, so how, how do we get these large, this sort of variation in the offset between sulfate and pyrite, um, even though we have microbial fractionation that is nearly invariant and close to the equilibrium fractionation. And the reason is uh, basically the, uh, uh, the distribution of, of depositional environments and their characteristic properties. So near, near the shorelines um, or uh, near the coastlines, we have sediment supply rates that are higher, porosity is typically lower, um, iron is more, uh, is more available, organic matter is more available. And what this, uh, this results in a more closed system where um, sulfate is drawn down more rapidly within the sediment and its isotopes are distilled. And this leads to a uh, pyrite or a pooled pyrite product that is closer in isotopic composition to the seawater sulfate. That's what happens in nearshore environments. And so this is why we see these smaller apparent uh, offsets um, close to, uh, to the coastlines. When we move offshore, in offshore environments, sedimentation rates are lower, there's less organic matter, there's less iron available, porosity is usually higher, and this leads to better buffering of the um, concentration and isotopic composition of, of um, poor water sulfate to that of the overlying seawater sulfate. And so that results in, in uh, larger fractionations uh, because we are not distilling, isotopically distilling the sulfate in, in the poor water. Um, and so yeah, that's what gives rise to, to these, um, to, to these uh, patterns that we observe. Um, one other thing that uh, is related to uh, the variation of this over Earth history is the concentration of bottom water sulfate. So think about it this way, for a given set of depositional parameters, including the sedimentation rate and organic matter content, the more sulfate there is in the water column, um, the harder it is to, um, to distill it and the more buffered it will be to seawater sulfate. And so a part of what we observe in the uh, moving from the Archean to the Proterozoic to the Phanerozoic is related to an increase in the sulfate concentration in seawater. Now moving from the Proterozoic to the Phanerozoic, uh, there's also a change in bioturbation and other things uh, that I won't go into, um, but we think that change in the sulfate concentrations is a major um, one of the major changes occurring here. Okay, so uh, to summarize, um, we would like to interpret isotopic records because they hold information on processes of interest uh, in Earth history, uh, but we need in to understand uh, the underlying processes in order to do this. And so to understand the processes at the very basis uh, of the you know, pyramid that I showed, um, we uh, develop bioisotopic models and these describe the fractionations at the base of isotopic records. Uh, they can provide insight into microbial physiology and uh, energy conservation in, in metabolic reactions. Um, and we can use them in, uh, in environmental models to understand isotopic variations. Um, and uh, this, there's still a lot that, that can be done with these. And two specific insights that we learned um, you know, looking, uh, looking out uh, using these models is that sulfur isotope fractionation 
in sulfate reduction. And uh, carbon, hydrogen, and clumped iso fractionation methanogenesis and methanotrophy are controlled by the reversibility of intracellular reactions. This is something in common to all of these metabolic isotopic models. Um, and that pyrite delta S34 values in modern marine sediments and in sedimentary rocks is controlled by the openness of the system. Um, and this is despite uh, the presence of large microbial fractionation. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Itai. Really enlightening um, subject and a very important one um, for all the people actually working on the marine and lacustrine environment. It's Thanks. actually really impressive that may, we need to really understand deep the, the fractionation in isotopes before doing a good paleo, paleo environmental and paleoclimatic interpretation. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's uh, definitely what I think. Um, yeah. We do have uh, questions already in the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. John Greenlee is asking, how much impact does bioturbation of sediments contribute to the GAG? Okay, so um, I mean that's a great question. Um, so bioturbation. I mean, are are you asking this uh, from the perspective of Earth history or um, anthropogenic um, greenhouse gases, or both? Um, from, from, from the aspect of, of anthropogenic uh, uh, greenhouse gases, um, the changes that we affect on the Earth system would have to have an effect, uh, have an effect on, on bioturbation in order for that to affect the greenhouse gases, and that, that may be the case. Um, but more generally, and especially looking back through Earth history, when you have uh, bioturbation, you're, you're essentially... Um, more effectively incinerating organic matter that is deposited in the sediment. So before that, you, uh, organic matter gets deposited and whatever electron acceptors can get to it by diffusion or are deposited together with it, um, the microbial communities can get to work on, on that organic matter and release um, some of the carbon back. Um, when you have bioturbation, you essentially have a means of getting these energetic electron acceptors like oxygen, like nitrate, deeper into the sediments and burning through more of the organic matter. On one hand, that means that more of the carbon is recycled and released back as DIC into the uh, ocean and on, on thousand year timescales back in, into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Um, on the other hand, it means that you're, uh, you're making less methane um, because um, the organic matter gets degraded by, by aerobic, um, aerobic pathways. Um, now, that being said, the methane uh, that, is, that is produced in marine sediments over most of Earth history uh, is quite effective, you know, other than in special environments like seeps or, or things like that, is in most cases um, oxidized by the overabundance of sulfate in, in the water column. So even if it does make it into the water column, most of it gets oxidized. Um, so bioturbation definitely affects the cycling of elements and, and where it occurs. It uh, is thought to have decreased the burial efficiency of organic matter um, because, uh, due to prolonged exposure to um, oxygenated conditions. Um, and, um, but as for effects on the greenhouse gases, I would guess an increase in PCO2, uh, a transient increase in PCO2 is expected at the onset of bioturbation. I think that may be a part of, I, I, I don't remember the, uh, uh, the papers on this, but I recall suggestions that this is uh, responsible for some of the Paleozoic warmth. So as um, uh, you know, animals uh, emerged and began um, by um, you know, digging in, in, in the sediments, the Paleozoic, uh, um, in, the, in the early Paleozoic, uh, temperatures are thought to have been around uh, 30 or 40 degrees, a global average 30 or 40 degrees Celsius, and that may be related to release of more carbon dioxide from, from sediments. Um, I can see another question. How do you deal with non-uniqueness of the models generated? Okay, so that's, that's an excellent question. There is uncertainty on, so even before we take this to, um, to natural environments where there's large uncertainty on many of the parameters, 
we have uncertainty on the parameters of, uh, of the reactions themselves. And that can be the kinetic, uh, the, the enzyme kinetics, right? The half saturation constants or the catalytic rate constants. This can be the fractionations associated with the um, individual reactions. So there's, there's lots of uncertainty uh, in these models. What we try and do in, in these cases um, is um, in some cases, we basically invert the isotopic data in order to learn about these um, poorly constrained parameters. So for example, if we're, um, we, we test the sensitivity to the parameters that usually narrows down uh, the list of parameters to which the, the model is um, sensitive. And what I mean by that is essentially there, there are parameters that you can vary up and down and they won't do, they, they hardly affect the, the model. You end up with, a, with, with an abbreviated list of, uh, of parameters that do um, affect the, uh, the outcome of the model. And if that list is small enough, you can try and invert observational data in order to constrain the values of those parameters. We sometimes do that, but, it, but more often what we do is we sample the, uh, we do a Monte, Monte Carlo simulation essentially, where we sample the parameter values from distributions that represent uncertainty in their values. And so a part of what gives rise to, um, let, let me see if I can, whoops. A part of what, a part of what gives rise to uh, some of the envelopes that I showed. So, uh, you know, like these envelopes that, that I showed around uh, uh, Jonathan's uh, results here. Um, a part of that comes from these Monte Carlo simulations where we draw parameter values from, from distributions. Um, and uh, one last thing that we do is uh, we try to communicate our, you know, the insights that we gain from these models um, in, in a responsible enough way to, um, so that it is clear that, that the results depend on uh, the parameters that we input to the model. And, um, you know, we provide all of the distributions from which we sample the parameters, et cetera. Uh, so that uh, you know, so that readers can make up their uh, their own mind about the you know how robust these insights are or or not. Thank you very much, uh, Itai. Somebody else has a question. I actually have a question, but I don't know exactly if I will be able to formulate uh, correctly. So I just wonder if you may track after um, a series of, I mean, of our fractionations in, mm -hmm. it's operational fractionations, but happening in like two events, let's say one event happening in the far past, mm -hmm. which um, may cause um, fractionation from one uh, uh, isotope to another, and eventually, in the near past, mm -hmm. when that isotope is again fractionated into a third one, so a family of three. Get it? Get my point? I'm not sure I get your point. Are you talking about three different isotopes, or yeah, two, two, uh, or so? According um, to yeah, with evolution through time, that you will have a series of events occurring, which may not necessarily. Uh, stop with fractionation from one side, one from A to B, rather A mm -hmm. to B, and something else happened that B goes to C. Get my point. So, uh, so you're talking about three isotopic reservoirs, but not yeah. three not three isotopes. Yeah. So maybe like uh, like a, a reaction from A to B occurring early on, say during early diagenesis, and then a further, re which is a fractionating reaction, then a reaction from B to C that occurs during maybe exposure or something like that. That is, yeah. that is again, a fractionating um, uh, reaction. And, you know, how do we know which, um, which is which? The, uh, the short answer is um, uh, auxiliary or complementary geochemical data and an attempt to account for both processes in, in our treatment. And what do I mean by that? So um, let me give you an example. Let's say you form pyrite in marine sediments. That's your first, uh, you know, your microbial sulfate reduction is the first um, uh, fractionating reaction. 
and then um, you oxidize some of that pyrite um, upon exposure and there's a small fractionation associated with that. The residual pyrite has a certain isotopic composition and you're, you're asking the question of, you know, how do we deconvolve these two processes that are affecting its isotopic composition? We can do that by checking the iron speciation in the core, seeing um, uh, what that tells us about pyrite formation and oxidation. And we can check the sulfur speciation we can check for um, sulfate that is produced by the oxidation of that sulfide and check its isotopic composition to see whether they correspond to each other. So that's what I mean when I say um, uh, complementary data. So these are, are, are data that help us to uh, essentially uh, get a better idea of the suite of, of processes or events that, the, uh, that our sample has gone through. And the second thing is to try to account for these things in, 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 our, in, in our treatment, right? So um, uh, in, in our quantitative treatment or, or in, in our models. So the diagenetic model that I showed um, briefly uh, a few minutes ago, um, we try and include in it all the processes that, that could affect the fractionation of, of sulfur isotopes. And I can, you know, I can tell you that usually you end up with one or two major influences and all the other you know, bells and whistles that we end up putting in the model don't really end up making much of a difference. Um, but those, those are essentially the, uh, the two ways. More, more data that can help us to constrain the importance of the, uh, of the processes and actually accounting for the processes in our uh, models. Yeah, yeah. Okay. May I ask a question? Yeah. yeah, please go ahead. Um, hi, Tai. Thank you. Hi. Um, mm -hmm. This was a very uh, deep conversation. This was a very deep uh, lecture, not always, sometimes too deep for me, but uh, as a geophysicist. Mm -hmm. But really, uh, I have a, a, a basic question that maybe uh, was a misunderstanding. What you do is you, do, you quantify the fractionation in order to understand the reservoir eventually preserved in your uh, record, right? It, That's right. Can your <clears throat> models be uh, be utilized to to turn around and ask what is the impact to quantify the impact cross impact with the environment? Sure, because um, you know when we, for example, take a diagenetic model and use it to understand the isotopic composition of the pyrite. An outcome of that is, um, you know, how much sulfate is reduced, how much is reoxidized, and makes it makes it back to the water column. How much organic matter is is oxidized? How much of the carbon, the, you know, the DIC precipitates in the pore waters uh, or in the pores as carbonate, and how much makes it back into the uh, into the ocean? So, um, we can once we have such models developed, right? We can use the isotopic composition. In um, in sediment cores or in uh, in um, sections in you know in stratigraphic sections or things like that, we can use that in order to reconstruct uh, fluxes and so and to say something about both you know the chemical and isotopic fluxes um, back from the sediments into um, into the ocean and okay. and of course the stuff that doesn't make it back into the ocean and gets buried if you're interested in the more long term. Um, you know, biogeochemical balances. Can you use the 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 the, the microbiota, the, the existing microbiota, as your input to the to the estimation? Because eventually, um, if we take mean, a sediment core now and we mm -hmm. want to evaluate what's going on now, mm -hmm. what can we do? We can take a, we can take a pore water, yes, a, and that would give us some idea of of the of the environment and the and we can take uh, the, 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 the microorganisms and, and, and mm -hmm. that would give us another perspective. Now, I go back to John's uh, point, which was very good. Many times we, we, uh, we find a lot of bioturbation at the seafloor. And, uh, mm -hmm. and then really all we have in order to, to assess the fluxes is the microbiota. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, so I mean, essentially, there there are people who who are studying you know, various techniques, uh, you know, various uh, with increasingly popular uh, omics techniques, uh, the the microbial population, and uh, getting 
constraints on the activity and the rates that are independent of the uh, geochemical profiles uh, in terms of the community that's there and what they what they can do and um, whether in fact they are or are not doing it um, I think in the in the end it doesn't um, it provides I see too many talks of uh, you know, where people are asking, let's see who's there and what they're doing, right? In terms of using genomics or, or uh, transcriptomics to, you know, to see, or proteomics to see uh, what, what microorganisms are there and, and what they're doing, but actually not, not taking it to the next level of, okay, what does this tell us about, um, you know, let's turn this into flux estimates or, or things like that. I do see more and more studies using this to ask questions about um, evolution within marine sediments, whether it does or does not exist, or you know, whether you have selection from a pre-existing diversity of, of microbes at the sediment water interface. So all sorts of interesting questions about um, evolutionary dynamics or, or uh, you know, turnaround times of, um, of microbiota in, in marine sediments. Um, but I haven't seen this turned into robust constraints on, uh, on you know, on, on the things that you've asked, that you asked about. I can tell you that there is a, oh, we seem to be observing a contradiction in the results between looking at geochemical profiles in pore water and between incubation experiments, which should both be associated with the same flux from the seafloor, right. maybe at a different time scale, but they they yield very very different uh, very very different numbers. Can you can you understand such a? Well, so the first thing that I would the first thing that I would ask is, um, you know, are are the incubations um, faithfully reproducing the conditions within the sediments, or uh, are they given are the microbes given different? Concentrations of substrates. Typical geochemist. And... Immediately you suspect the incubations. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's not. It's not so much that I suspect the the incubations. It's that uh, you know they, you'll get different rates of, of uh, metabolic activity and production of this and production of that and consumption of of this and that, uh, depending on 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 the medium in which the incubations are uh, are performed. Um, yeah, you know, I, I would have I would have to see the um, you know I would have to see the data and the uh, the disagreement to uh, to formulate uh, uh, you know an, an informed opinion. I can't um, you know, come up with uh, with an explanation without more information. <laughs> is is that something of interest to you? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. We should talk. <laughs> okay, I think we need to to finish. It's already deep into the second um, Time. hour. Um, Thank you very much. Okay, Thank there you. is a comment over there from Gabriel. Um, he thanks, thanks you Gabriel. for the presentation. Yeah, you see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Okay. Really. Thank you very much, Itai. Thanks. Have a great afternoon and thanks for the invitation. You too. Bye bye. bye, -bye.